Today on Twin Cam, we are looking at yet another slice of 1950s Britain and another offering from the Roots Group. This is an Audax shape Hillman Minx. But before diving into this adorable little thing, it's time for a bit of a history lesson. The Hillman Motor Car Company was founded by William Hillman in 1907. He'd made his money through bicycles, and like a lot of people in his era, Hillman quickly moved into car production. After his death in the 1920s, the company fell into the hands of the Roots Brothers, forming the volume section of their car-making empire. As the bread and butter of the Roots Group, Hillman sat alongside the more luxurious Humber and more sporting Sunbeam. But no matter the badge on the front, Roots cars were always a little left of field a little quirkier than the Austins, Fords and Vauxhalls on offer in the 1950s. They did things a little bit differently and looked out over the Atlantic for their inspiration. Following the Second World War, the group found its home at Wrighton on Dunsmore near Coventry, and that is where our Minx was produced. The Minx name dates back to 1931 and the first Hillman model launched after the Roots takeover. The final Minx was produced in 1970, bringing an end to their most popular line, by which point Roots had sold to Chrysler. Under American ownership, the Hillman name was dropped before they retreated from Europe in 1978, selling their operations to Peugeot. What was once Roots did survive, with what would have been the Talbot Arizona being rebadged as the Peugeot 309. Wrighton became Peugeot's UK home, producing various models until it was closed in 2006. Therefore, the car we have here is a direct predecessor to the modern Peugeot 308, and this Minx is probably the most famous of them all. This generation goes by two names. At its launch in 1956, it was designated the Hillman Minx Series 1. And our car is a Minx Series 3B from 1961, roughly halfway through production. The final Minx of this body style was the Series 6, which was discontinued in 1967. Therefore, as you may expect, the first name for this car is the Series Hillman Minx. But the other, more common name was coined by its designers, Audax. And that's the name that's come to describe all the Roots cars of this style. As the bread and butter offering, this brought in the majority of sales with the more utilitarian but adorably boxy Hillman Husky slotting in underneath alongside its panel van cousin, the Comma Cobb. Above the Minx were the sporting and luxurious Sunbeam Rapier and Singer Gazelle, bringing more panache and rakishness to what was already quite a stylish design. Audax is a Latin word that translates directly as bold, and I'm sure that will give you some idea as to the design direction. While the Audax mix was designed in-house by Roots, they had a hand from none other than Raymond Lowy, the French designer responsible for some of America's most famous industrial products. In an automotive sense, he'd previously worked for Studebaker, so all you Americans in the comments of the Humber Hawk video, here you go. The style Lowy and Roots came up with combines a few American styling tweaks with traditional British proportions. The new body brought a whole lot more character to the Minx with its extrovert two-tone paintwork and the instantly recognisable full-width grille and wraparound rear screen, the reverse angle of which is mirrored by the rear windows. With these touches, there's no mistaking this for anything but a Roots product. There are places in which we can see a contrast between these styles though. At the front end, it's rounded and cute, standing attentive with its headlamps above the grille and proud of the bonnet line on which the Hillman name is presented across. The grille is one of the features that change the most to keep it in line with the times, though on this example, it still proclaims its American influence and in its center, a little red badge containing the three spires of Coventry. Move to the back of the car though, and the subtle fins and wraparound screen demonstrate that contrast. It's an eclectic blend of British and American, staid and proud at one end, and expressive, even slightly rakish at another. There is an absolute show of restraint here, with that American expressiveness aching to push its way out. But I think the 50s American style is a more interesting point than many of you will be thinking as this car can come to represent the seismic changes that came to the British and world motor industries in the 1960s. 
Overseas, the minks had an interesting ride. The American style wasn't lost on the colonials, who lapped up the minks as a compact, fuel-efficient offering in its early years, American sales even accounting for over 10% of worldwide Hillman production in 1957. After a fruitful first few years, the minks faded away as more American manufacturers offered smaller cars. But on the other side of the Pacific in Japan, the minks made more of a long-term impact. Following the end of the American occupation in 1952, the Japanese car industry was getting back on its feet, and several British companies made licensing agreements. The truck manufacturer Isuzu was looking into making passenger cars, and licensed the Minx from Roots, building it in Japan as the Isuzu Hillman Minx for 11 years. Therefore, the Minx played a small part in building the all-conquering Japanese motor industry that we know today. Back in the UK though, the Minx aged rather quickly. Roots may have been bang on the money styling-wise in the mid-50s, but the Audax Minx ran until 1967, by which point it was curvy in an increasingly straight-hedged and boxy world. The start of this was the introduction of the enormously successful Morris 1100 in 1962 with its sharp Pininfarina lines. Roots did work on a replacement though, launched in 1961 as the Hillman Super Minx, but the original Audax stayed on alongside it. Only the money of Chrysler produced a full replacement, and if you line up the Audax Minx to the Arrow Minx, you can see that they skipped a whole generation of styling. So, by the time the Minx was looking a little old hat, how much are Roots charging for one? Well, thanks to my very handy motorist guide, I can tell you that a Minx in 1956 would set you back £774, and I'll give you three other cars for reference. The larger Ford console was only £7 more, while the smaller but posher Wolseley 1500 was 15 quid less. The Wolseley is an interesting point, as when I say plusher, I really mean it. But if we fast forward to 1964, the same year as this motorist guide, the Minx's price has been revised to £636, a reduction of 138 quid. However, an FB Vauxhall Victor was exactly the same price, £636, and a Ford Cortina 1500 was 35 quid more. Those are both bigger and more modern cars. On the flip side, the smaller but much more advanced Morris 1100 was £594, some 42 quid cheaper. Finally, the Austin A60 had grown into the next segment, but that was all the way up at £757. That now sounds a lot more sensible, but it still had the price of a slightly larger and more modern car, so why would you buy a Minx or any Roots car? Well, the one that I immediately see is quality. Root stuff just has a sense of solidity and thoughtful design about it, and that is why we've moved inside. Firstly, I'm very happy to say that the azure blue paintwork has followed us in here to the material that Root's called vinide. It's basically vinyl. But it is on top of this lovely bench seat, which means that technically you could fit six of you in here, and the Minx was marketed in some territories as a six-seater. But you'd have to be very, very friendly with your passengers, not only as there is a big transmission tunnel taking up all the space, and in this one a floor shifter, some mixes had column shifters, but also the fact that the Audax is only 155 centimetres wide, and depending on how you express your measures, that's 61 inches. So realistically, it's a four-seater, maybe five if you could squeeze someone in the back, probably a child. If you're wondering, the handbrake is down by the door, and there are no seatbelts, because it's 1961. Everything in here is function first, but it's so impeccably designed. A lot of cars of this era had their controls strewn about their place, and heater boxes slung up underneath the dashboard with their controls peeking out. In the Minx, everything is contained within this central pod. You have, of course, your basic instruments, including a speedometer, fuel gauge and water temperature in F's because the world is still in black and white in 1961 and then you have pull switches for your choke, your lights and your wipers and they all just feel really nice and of course your ignition over on the right. Below those are your heater controls, your direction controls in particular 
and they all just have a nice click to them. I mean, not only is having the heater controls properly integrated into the dashboard quite a rarity for a car of this size, of this age, but having them feel so satisfying to use is just completely unheard of. Of course, apart from that, you have your four-speed gear lever, which has a very short, very precise throw. Your indicators, which, as it demonstrated a little too well there, actually self-cancel. Again, this is something for 1961. Your handbrake, as I mentioned before, and the horn ring. And as we discovered in the Humber Hawk video, Roots cars... Roots cars have proper horns. In the back there is another bench and quite a bit of headroom for a small saloon car but this is towards the end of the era of cars being very nearly as tall as they are wide. In fact it's only four centimetres wider than it is tall. That's partially why the car looks so proud of itself at the front. The total height is 151 centimetres or 59 and a half inches but if you're a giant you could go for the Minx convertible which has unlimited headroom. Owing to the design though, the door opening doesn't quite line up with the seat. That's true of a lot of cars of this era, meaning that getting in and out is not the easiest. Also, there isn't an awful lot of legroom. There isn't a lot of legroom because there is quite a lot of boot space. 382 litres or 13 and a half cubic feet, though there is a spare wheel taking up half of it, a hump in the boot floor towards the back, and quite a bit of a load lip at the front, so anyone you murder had better have been a contortionist. Clearly, Roots decided that having space for dead bodies was more important than having living ones in the seats. If you do need the space though, there was also a Minx estate, and I'd expect that the hump in the floor is for the differential and live axle, as the main boot floor is pretty low. That axle sits on leaf springs, and for the Series 3B, the diff ratio was altered to improve the top speed to the dizzying heights of 80 miles per hour. Another thing that was new for the 3B was synchromesh on all four gears, though there is one little quirk I absolutely love, and that's the fact that it has a straight cut first gear, so it sounds incredible. If you're British and old enough, that whine was the soundtrack to motoring from the 50s to the 80s, as there were stacks of British cars with the same arrangement. Also available was a Smith's three-speed automatic transmission known as Easy Drive, which was exceptionally posh for a normal car when it became available in 1959. At the pointy end of the 411cm or 162 inch Minx is the engine, which is pretty conventional as well. It's an overhead valve four cylinder petrol unit, the same one introduced at the end of the old Minx's life, but it was fresh enough not to embarrass the Audax. The Series 1 made do with a 1390cc variant, but by the end of production this had grown to 1725cc. Our car sits in the middle of that with 1494cc and a single Zenith carburettor, allowing it to produce 52 brake horsepower or 40 kilowatts at 4,400 RPM and 72 pound-feet or 98 newton meters of torque at 2,200 RPM. That, alongside the revised diff ratio, means 0 to 60 in 22 seconds. That is all rather normal for 1961 though. Keeping it pointing where you want is a recirculating ball steering box aimed at an independent front end suspended by coil springs on wishbones with an anti-roll bar and telescopic dampers all round. And don't take those for granted in 1956. The monocoque shell was also rather rigid, meaning the Minx's road manners are enviable compared to some of its contemporaries. Certainly enough to entertain the sporting pretensions of the Sunbeam, and for Roots to highlight the exploits of Minx's competing in the gruelling Safari Rally. Getting all 1,016 kilograms or 2,240 pounds of Hillman Minx to stop are drums all round, though for 1963 the Series 5 gained discs at the front to sit under the smaller 13-inch wheels. Older examples like ours sat on 15s. So the Minx wasn't an engineering revelation, and it's largely forgotten. 
It's a quaint and curvaceous slice of the 50s, and therefore it seems I've come to the same conclusion I did the other week with the Humber Hawk. The Minx was a fine car that just suddenly became of a bygone age. It's the end of an era for British cars as BMC moved onto front wheel drive and hydroelastic suspension dominating the small car market, while Ford moved on to dominate the fleet market with its sharp continental Cortina. Over in Japan as well, the Minx represents international cooperation to help the Japanese economy grow and produce one of the greatest car industries the world has ever seen. The little Hillman Minx, a cute slice of 1950s Britain that was the indicator of a changing world. On that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please do click like and subscribe to Twin Cam as well, and I'll have more videos coming along soon.